After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Sencrie, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. But when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and, when, and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia, Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Well done. Didn't even remind you that time. <clears throat> um, Acts chapter 18. Uh, listen, we're going we're gonna to jump right to the text this morning. We have a meal to take, and we have a lot of ground to cover here uh, in figuring out who this guy Apollos is and Priscilla and Aquila and all that happened with these folks. So we're going to jump right in. Uh, what I found in this passage, by the way, we're going through the book of Acts. If you haven't been with us, uh, the book of Acts is a story of the foundation of the church. Um, after Jesus came and died and rose from the dead and ascended back to the Father, he called his disciples to go and make other disciples from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and teaching them to observe and baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that was commanded. And so here his disciples are going from town to town, place to place, nation to nation, planting churches and seeing people uh, come to faith in Jesus. And Paul is one of his uh, <clears throat> least disciples, as he would call himself, uh, a disciple who, or apostle who came along later um, and has now been planting churches um, over in Macedonia, far from uh, Jerusalem, and now they're making their way into Asia. And as we see Paul leave Achaia and go to Asia and Galatia and uh, Phrygia, I noticed three examples of church leaders doing hard things. And so I tried to sort of name this sermon Tough Choices or Hard Decisions, because um, that's kind of what I see happening in the events uh, of the text we just read. We do see the continuation of Paul's relationship with Aquila and Priscilla as they journey with him to Ephesus. Remember, Paul had been wanting to go to Ephesus since before the Macedonian call, um, and so they get to Ephesus, and then they meet a new partner in the ministry named Apollos. And all three of these individuals from Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla, and uh, Apollos have a very different skill set and ability, um, but they are all equally passionate about the building up of the church. They were driven, motivated, burdened for the spiritual care of the people of God. They were gripped by the truth, and because of their love for the church and their devotion to Christ, they did some hard stuff. And by God's grace, their hard decisions here in this passage caused the church to flourish. So I ask us this, this morning, when was the last time you had to make a hard decision for the health and well-being of this church? The book of Acts paints a picture of sacrificial living poured out for the good of the church as a very normal thing. This is what Christians did and do. They pour themselves out for the building up of the kingdom. This wasn't just Paul. This wasn't just Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos. This was all the Christians who were coming to faith in Christ. All of us have to make a choice on Sunday mornings to set the alarm, right? To get dressed, to write the check if we tithe, to say a prayer, to bring a notebook, to bring a large cup of coffee with us. That's sacrificial living. Um, then there are other hard decisions, like who are we going to disciple in the local church? Or who are we going to let disciple us in the local church? Or maybe it's a decision of who we will bear a burden with, maybe a financial burden, 
or maybe meeting some other need of a family in the congregation. I'm sure all of us face the hard decision, perhaps on a weekly basis, of whether or not we will bring up the gospel in average conversations throughout the week with friends and family and co-workers. Will we tell them about Jesus, even if it might be uncomfortable? Will we share Christ and his message of salvation? If you will give yourself to life and ministry of a local church, you will be faced with these kinds of hard decisions all the time. And I pray that this sermon encourages all of us to choose wisely, to number our days, to do hard things for the glory of God. So here's the three hard things I found in this passage that will outline our time together. Staying and leaving is the first one. Staying and leaving. Second one is confrontation. And the third one is refuting. Staying and leaving, confrontation, refuting. Staying and leaving, verse 18, begins actually how verse 1 began with those two words, after this. After this. What, what are we supposed to do when we read after this? After what? <laughs> right? What just happened? What just took place? Why, how are these connected? Paul left Macedonia on his own. He made his way down to Achaia and to Corinth. And he immediately looked for partners in the ministry. The Lord gave him Priscilla and Aquila, who were tent makers, right? So they got to build tents together, and they supported uh, him as he continued to be a, mission, a missionary to the people of Corinth. Silas and Timothy finally get there, right? They catch up with the train, and they have a gift from Philippi so that they can continue ministering the gospel to those there in Achaia. Um, and then... Many Jews oppose and revile Paul as he preached the gospel, uh, but some did believe, including the ruler of the synagogue, Crispus, and Sosthenes, and many local Corinthians believed in Jesus. Uh, And then Sosthenes, the passage ended last week with him being beaten, uh, basically in Paul's place, and Paul being spared. um, But Sosthenes was proud to do so. Of all the things that happened there in Corinth, I think what's particularly interesting that connects that passage to this one is how long Paul stayed there. The text says in verse 11 that he stayed there a year and six months teaching the Word of God, and this verse verse 18, what we have today, says that he stayed many days longer. That's pretty much the longest he stays in any mission, you know, close to two years. And I think what we can see from that is Paul maybe didn't want to leave so soon. It was hard for him to move on to the next mission. These folks needed discipling. The church was a hot mess. If you read 1 and 2 Corinthians, that's like the worst of them all. (laughs) He had to stay there a while uh, to get things in order. They needed discipling. But I think it was also hard for him to leave just because he loved them. He loved them. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 1 says. I give thanks to my God always for you, to the people of Corinth, because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in Him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called in the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul loved all the churches that he went and ministered to, right? Um, but nothing says, I love you, more than time. And he was there for a while. He gave time to them. And I think it's worth pointing out as we get started, it takes time to build a church. 18 months is more than a lot of pastors stay in churches today. 18 months is more than many church members are willing to give in order to see their church become healthy or grow if there are issues. When was the last time you committed to something and stayed with it for 18 months? You can do kind of a lot. I can't think of much you can't do in 18 months if you really set your mind to it. Um, I was meaning to ask Stephen and Valerie this um, this morning, but I thought about if if you, and I Googled it, so (laughs) you tell me if Google's right or wrong. If you move to a new country or a new nation and they speak a different language, it takes about a year to 18 months to become fluent in that culture's language, living among, maybe not reading and writing, but being able to communicate. All that to say, you stay with it, 18 months, fruit takes time. Fruit takes time. I sometimes explain the story of what's happened at our church, how we replanted, and people look at me like I'm kind of crazy. Because what they're expecting me to follow up with is not that we have 45 members, two elders, and three deacons. 
uh, and you know, we're kind of shrimpy compared to some other churches. They're expecting us to have 500 members and weekly baptisms and all of these wonderful uh, theatrical things happening week after week. But it's not what we see here, is it? Um, April was 18 months since we replanted. 18 months ago, we reconstituted together as a church. If you've made it that long, well done. I'm glad you're with us. Praise to the Lord for your faithfulness. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, sometimes the Lord grows his church overnight. But most of the time, it's a slow, faithful, trod pilgrimage towards health and Christian living. Acts 2, just one chapter. 28 chapters of the book of Acts. Okay? The rest of it is slow faithfulness committed towards the Lord for a long period of time. That's what I want to see happen in our church. To stay, commit ourselves for a long time. Paul's going to leave, and that's a hard decision for him. Your hard decision is probably to keep your boots on the ground and stay here for a long time and love people, because slow fruit is good fruit. I don't know if we'll ever have 500 members in weekly baptisms, but if the Lord decides to do that, I would expect it to happen after you staying here for 10 years and being faithful and committed to the work for the long haul and loving the people. So friends, I would love it if you stayed. If you're not a member yet, I would love it if you became a member and stayed a long time. I invite you as your pastor, as your friend, stay. Plod with us, trod with us as long as you possibly can. But something else I've learned in nearly eight years of ministry here in Spindale is that the longer we stay, the harder it is to say goodbye. After many days, Paul took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila and then he cut his hair because he was under a vow. So probably about two years, he finally leaves. He takes Priscilla and Aquila with him. And then 1 Corinthians 1, we know he probably also took Sosthenes. But what happened in Corinth was the church lost members. And they didn't just lose members, they lost their power players. They lost the good ones, right? To go and see the church come to fruition in Ephesus. They probably hugged and cried and wept, thinking they may never see each other again. But why did they leave? Multiplication by subtraction. They left the church in Corinth to see the church in Ephesus helped. Corinth's loss was Ephesus's, Ephesus's gain. Uh, and then verse 20 says Paul didn't even stay in Ephesus. He was there for a short time. He left Priscilla and Aquila there. They asked him to stay, but he declined and moved on to strengthen disciples in other places. So what I think is going on here, there's not this merely calculated, pre-planned, ordered decision going on. Two clues tell us that Paul was sort of at a spiritual crossroads here. He cut his hair because he was under a vow. And then verse 21 says, when they say, please come back to Ephesus, he says, I'll come if the Lord wills. I'll come if the Lord wills. Uh, I had lunch with a guy one time who had long hair. And then when I met him for lunch, I was surprised to see he had a fresh buzz cut. And I was like, what happened? He said, well, God told me to shave my head. I was like, okay. Uh, and it turns out he had been reading his Bible, <laughs> and he read Acts chapter 18, but nobody really taught him how to read the Bible, um, so he, he cut his hair after reading Acts chapter 18. Friends, I've got good news. This passage is not telling you to shave your head, right? Be at rest if any of you are worried that that's what the application is. You don't have to shave your head today. Um, we don't know exactly what's going on with this vow. Um, there was a traditional vow called the Nazarite vow. Uh, which involved the shaving of one's head. Um, but we don't know Paul's intent exactly here. And I think Luke, Luke just kind of records us, records this event to let us know he was wrestling with something. There was something between him and the Lord as far as direction and purpose and what's next. I think this vow was part of that. Um, Paul didn't necessarily leave Corinth because he wanted to. He was committed to the purpose uh, of Christ in, in building his church. Um, but he decided to leave because he wanted to make hard decisions for the building up of the church. He knew the Lord was calling him onward to the nations, and perhaps his heart was stuck in Corinth. He left. He knew it would be good for Ephesus, but it was hard. It was hard to leave Corinth. 
perhaps the shaving of his head was this physical symbol of a renewed commitment to holiness and following Jesus, no matter how difficult or where it might lead him. So my application this morning is not that some of y'all need to leave. That's also not my application. Um, if we were planting a new church, that'd be a good reason to go. If we... James 4.13 says, Come now, you who say to today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a town, spend a year there, and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? It's a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So pray, make a plan, and say every day if the Lord wills, because he has every right to change the plan. But if we reject his plan, we face the possibility of missing out on something awesome. If Paul was unwilling to leave Corinth and to commission Aquila and Priscilla to work in Ephesus, we might have never gotten to meet Apollos. Paul went on to Antioch and Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the souls of the disciples. And meanwhile, the Lord, meanwhile, the Lord was working in Ephesus. And the second point is confrontation, the second hard thing. Verse 24 tells us that there was a Jew named Apollos. Uh, Apollos came to Ephesus. He was a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. So this guy is being talked up pretty good by Luke, huh? He's pretty much cream of the crop um, as far as Messianic Jews go. But he only knew of the baptism of John, what the text says. So here was this Jew that was there for the ministry of John the Baptist. The guy who came eating locusts and honey, right, got insect legs sticking out of his teeth. Um, and he, boy, shouting out of the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, repent and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I must decrease, he must increase, right? All the stuff that John the Baptist's ministry was known for, he's baptizing people based on a baptism of repentance for the coming of the Messiah, whose sandal he would not even be worthy to untie. There was someone greater. His ministry was all about the supremacy of Christ. And Apollos came in contact with this teaching somewhere along the way, and he adopted it 100%. He went all in for this Lamb of God that was coming to take away the sins of the world. He was instructed in the way of the Lord, and he never looked back. And there were some things missing in his theology, right? We're going to find that out in a minute. But before we get there, notice how the Lord got a hold of him. He was competent in Scripture, and he was fervent in spirit. He knew the text that showed Jesus as Lord, and he didn't just stoically or bashfully talk about these passages. The word fervent in Greek is one of those cool onomatopoeia words. Everybody say onomatopoeia. Say it ten times real fast. I'm just joking, you have to do that. But an onomatopoeia is more than just the best word on hangman. It's when a word sounds like the thing that it is. So this word is one of those in the Greek. Zeo means to bubble or boil over, or like the sound of a hot, crackling fire. Zeo. Zeo is how they would use to describe that. And it's a figurative language here, referring to his great and ardent zeal. He had passion that boiled up to the outside of his spirit. So let's be honest. Is this something Baptists are particularly known for? Maybe not. We've got things we are known for that are good. This may not be one of them. Not exactly our strong suit. We tend to shy away from desire or zeal because it's too tied up in our feelings. And someone told us one time that feelings are bad. So over time, we learn to worship and serve the Lord without our hearts. And when we worship and serve the Lord without our hearts, we become legalistic and slaves to, to Jesus, basically, in, in a bad kind of way. We worship Him routinely, and without any true worship in spirit and in truth. Um, passion and enthusiasm and excitement about the gospel and about the kingdom of God is a very good thing. Apollos was commended for these things. Not talked about negatively. He was commended for his passion and his zeal. In fact, based on the way it reads, this was at least partly part of what made him a good teacher. Because he was zealous and passionate and fervent in spirit. He was eloquent, 
He spoke and taught accurately. And we've known many preachers and teachers who taught inaccurately or incompetently. We've known many preachers and teachers who've taught uh, without any fervor. I believe both of these qualities being strengthened together in a leader makes for healthy leadership, particularly when it comes to a public teaching ministry. We want every member of Main Street to be competent in the scriptures. Amen? We want that. But we also want you to be enthusiastically sold out for the gospel and the kingdom of God. I want that for you. I want that for myself. Do you remember what it felt like when you first learned about Jesus? There was an earnest and youthful longing in your soul to give your life away for the Savior. There was a compelling call within you, a captivating voice that whispered truth and caused your aching bones to shout and chains of sin fell off of your arms. Your heart of stone was turned to a heart of flesh. Christianity is not a mere religion based on a statement of faith. It is the ministry of the bridegroom wooing his bride. Come to me, says the Lord Jesus. Don't cauterize your feelings in the name of theological precision. Train your fervor and enthusiasm and passion to be used for healthy leadership and to be used for the Great Commission in combination with the instruction of Scripture. This is why Apollos was command, commended. He had a lot going for him in Ephesus. Paul kind of dropped off Aquila and Priscilla, and they're doing their thing. And we don't know really of anybody else there at this point. I'm sure there were others. But it's kind of the three of them teaching the, the Word of God to these Asians. But Apollos, uh, his understanding of the gospel was limited. It was, it was partial. He was missing some crucial things. He, he was teaching accurately and fervently, but he was not teaching Fully. No one had yet explained to him the rest of the story. So verse 26, Priscilla and Aquila heard him speaking boldly in the synagogue, and they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. He wasn't a false teacher. He wasn't deceiving people. He wasn't necessarily doing anything wrong. He wasn't in error, but there was something lacking. There was an area of weakness in his doctrine. So they took him aside. Apollos heard it and was able to continue teaching in the way of the Lord. This is where I get the word confrontation at this whole second point. Conversations like these can be uncomfortable today, but it is also our Christian responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ to confront one another when there is something lacking in our doctrine. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, what is God's word? What is scripture? It is breathed out by God. And it is useful, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. If we're not teaching the whole counsel of God, we are incomplete, not equipped for every good work. Apollos was not complete and was therefore not equipped. He needed to be made complete in his doctrine. So Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and opened his eyes to the truth that he might be reproved and corrected. This private and short scene in the book of Acts is a picture of what healthy confrontation is supposed to look like in the church still today. And confrontation, again, is kind of a strong word for what happened. There was no issue of morality. There was no sin on Apollos' part. There was no great personal offense that took place. This was just insufficient doctrine that needed to be filled out. The Bible calls us to teach one another so that each of us may be built up and instructed in the truth. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, richly, fully, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual God, so, songs uh, to God with thankfulness in your hearts. This is why we sing, and we sing to one another truth. Romans 5, or 15, 14, I love this verse. He says, I am satisfied myself about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. A better word might just be discipleship. Are you able to disciple one another in the body of Christ? All of us are called to instruct each other in the word, not just elders and pastors and Sunday school teachers. This is a ministry for every single person in this room. Let me point out a couple of things that I think will be helpful for us to put into practice. 
first. Priscilla and Aquila noticed the problem together. This wasn't a gray area. They didn't approach Apollos based on a hunch. You know, I think something's wrong. I'm not sure what he means by that. You know, there, there wasn't like this maybe thing going on. They saw, both of them together, saw uh, uh, something lacking in his teaching, in his doctrine. So they approached him with his sermons laid out next to the scriptures. There was an actual conversation to be had about actual content. So if you have a concern about someone's doctrine, can you actually spell it out? Or are you going on a hunch? You're going, I don't like the way you said that, you know? Or is it just something that doesn't feel right? Pinpoint what the actual problem is if there is indeed an actual problem. This is especially true of church leaders. You know, we often see in pastoral transitions, new pastors come and churches look for, look for the, the first doctrinal problem they can find, but they can't actually pinpoint a problem. They just want to sort of cause a fuss sometimes. Meanwhile, 1 Timothy 5 says to be extremely slow when you admit a charge against an elder, to do so only on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And this is what Aquila and Priscilla did. And this is what we ought to do. Secondly, they took him aside in order to have this conversation, right? They didn't stand up. You know, I heard a story one time about a pastor who was preaching, and somebody stood up in the middle of his sermon and sort of, you know, refuted what he was saying. That's never happened to me. You know, praise the Lord. <laughs> um, but but um, they didn't do that, right? They, they didn't uh, want to publicly embarrass Apollos. They didn't wait till the next business meeting to bring it up. Uh, they didn't want to start a rumor mill and talk to other people about Paulus's dangerous teaching. They went directly to him, and they did it privately. This is how we behave if there's a question about doctrinal concern. Do you go to others to talk about it directly and privately? Or do you bring it up to other people? Or do you bring it up in public? In general, even if it's not a doctrinal thing, if it's some other issue, if it is a personal offense or an issue of morality or sin taking place, it's always best to go directly to the person. Go to the source. Third, it's good to note this wasn't a rebuke. They took him aside to explain the gospel, not to punish him. They weren't trying to condemn him. They weren't trying to push him out of the ministry, saying, you're disqualified. You can't do this anymore. You need to stop teaching now. You're done, guy. No, they, they, were, they were loving towards him. They took him aside to explain the gospel to him. They loved Apollos and were thankful for him. They wanted him to continue in the ministry. So they didn't come with a spirit of aggression or seeking to attack him. They came with grace and peace. If you've ever had to confront somebody, what was your tone like? Did you come with humility and gentleness and kindness and the fruit of the Spirit? Or did you come with some other agenda that was motivated out of your flesh? Be kind, be gentle, be charitable, be honest. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Allow me to share a personal testimony here. Right before Tilly was born, I had a church member come to me, take me aside. This wasn't like moments before she was born or anything, but what I mean is a few weeks ago. And I didn't know what they were going to say. But in love for me and for this church, they said, Dale, I think you have a problem releasing responsibility when you delegate. I think you have a problem releasing responsibility when you delegate. I was planning all the Easter stuff that I wasn't going to be around for. The next two weeks of worship services, lining up the musicians, the preachers, and all the things. And I was delegating but I was also kind of doing the task for all the people that I was delegating to. You know what? They were right. And that was a word that I needed to hear. And I met it with a little bit of resistance at first. But when I thought about what they were telling me, they were absolutely right. I do maybe have a problem here. And if I want to live a long and healthy life, I have to give responsibility away to people that I trust and then let it be. And of course, this isn't some big theological problem, but it does have to do with my biblical assignment as a pastor to equip others for the work of ministry, not to do all the ministry of myself. That's a biblical teaching that I needed applied to my soul from someone who loved me. And I'm thankful that they did. So who has God put in your life to gently admonish you? 
I believe if we will submit to membership in the local church, God will put people in our lives to instruct us in the truth. And when we do receive that instruction, we need to do it with humility and see it as a gift from God's hand. Can you imagine what might have happened if Apollos was like, excuse me? Who do you think you are to be telling me what to preach and and teach? Right? No, he received it with great humility. In fact, we don't know his exact response, but Apollos was probably flooded with joy to find out the way of God more accurately. Who in this room doesn't want to find out the way of God more accurately? If you tell me the way of God more accurately, there's nothing my heart should do than rejoice to know God and his gospel better. Oh, I remember after becoming a Christian, finding out what the gospel truly entailed and the substitutionary atonement of Jesus and my sin replaced with his righteousness and what propitiation meant. I didn't know all of that the day I first believed. Oh, but the more I learned the way of God more accurately, my soul became more in love with the gospel and with the way of God. And the same goes for all of us. Same goes for kids. I'm trying to talk to kids, right? Same goes for you guys. Who has God put in your life to instruct you, I wonder? You're all smirking because you know who it is. Your parents, perhaps? Mom and dad? And you know they're sinners too. And they make mistakes. They don't always get it right. Hopefully they apologize to you and they get it wrong. But you should go ahead and decide right now in your youth to listen to them even when you think they're crazy. That's what I think the wisdom of Proverbs would recommend. It was written by a dad who made a lot of mistakes. And you know what that dad says? He says, lean not on your own understanding, but trust the Lord. If we who are younger would learn to listen to those who are older, and those who are older would learn to give generously, good, wise counsel to those who are younger, not bitterly, the church would flourish for generation after generation after generation after generation. Let's learn to do this well. Let's learn to do this well. The final point here, Paul did something hard, excuse me, Priscilla and Aquila did something hard. What was Apollos' hard thing? Well, of course, he had to hear this this, uh, truth and humble himself to receive it, but I think we see something else at the end of the passage that is worthy of our time. Verse 27, uh, Apollos decided to go down to Achaia where Paul came from. Um, the brothers welcomed him. They all wrote to Achaia, said, hey, listen, this guy Apollos is coming. Y'all need to welcome him. He's a brother. He's, he's legit. He's the real deal. And Apollos kind of picks up where Paul leaves off. And he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. And one quick danger to point out here. As Paul leaves and Apollos comes in, is that we're not to follow leaders based on their notoriety or their skill or eloquence. Um, I think we could make a scriptural argument that Apollos was a better preacher than Paul. Probably was a better orator, better with words, quicker on his feet, sharp mind, knew the scriptures, you know, fervent in spirit. And it seems like, you know, they loved him just like Paul. It doesn't seem like there's any hierarchy or division going on yet. But anytime there's a transition in leadership, there is the potential for worldliness and sin to creep in. We read that in 1 Corinthians 3 this morning. Uh, Some began to say, well, I follow Paul. Who do you think you are? Apollos. Some said, I follow Apollos. Paul left us. You know, that meanie head? He he, he didn't stay. He only stayed two years with us. So I'm following Apollos now. But Paul writes to them and says, enough. Both of these were gifts from God for the building up of his church. Some plant, some water. God gives the growth. And who builds the church? Is it Paul, Apollos, or Cephas? Who builds the church? How about the head of the church? Jesus builds his church. And any leader or gospel teacher or preacher that he gives to his church is a gift for the building up of his church. It's his church. He builds it. These were gifts from Jesus. So beware of preacher worship. I pity you if you ever try to worship me. Beware of worshiping other elders in this church. 
Beware of worshiping preachers online. Just beware of following people for notoriety in general. See all good and faithful teachers rather as gifts from Jesus to the building up of his church, edification of your soul, not as little gods. Amen. But I love verse 27 because this is why Apollos came. To greatly help those who through grace believe. There was not a single soul in Corinth that believed because of Paul or because of Apollos. Anyone who has ever believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ has only believed by grace. They, through grace, believed. So if I were to ask you today how you came to believe, what would you say? Would you tell me about the preacher? who invited you to come down the aisle or to say that prayer? Would you tell me about that time you decided to visit a church and how all the people were so friendly and loving and so you decided to stay? Would you tell me about vacation Bible school or that revival service? Would you tell me about that time you went through something really, really hard and you know then it seemed like the burden was lifted after you prayed and so you decided to follow Jesus after that? Because he made it better. We hear stories like this all the time. I heard one yesterday at the car show. And so seldom do I simply hear people say, I found out I was a sinner and my only hope was grace. I realized no preacher, nothing I could do or say, no work of my hands could ever merit a place in God's family. I had to have grace. And grace so freely poured. This is how anyone who ever comes to faith in Jesus believes. Perhaps you're here today and you have not truly received the grace of God to believe on Jesus. Hear me, friends. Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, died a sinner's death on our account, and he uh, rose from the dead after dying the death that we deserved. And in his resurrection, he defeated sin and hell for all those who had placed their faith in him. All of it is what Jesus did. None of it is what we did or are doing. Christ did it all. Have you believed by grace in his work, his gift, or something you think you can contribute? Have you believed by the eloquence of a preacher? Have you believed by a prayer you recited? Have you believed by going to church or any of the other things? Here this morning, the only way to believe is by the grace of Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of everyone's faith. You have no faith aside from him and him initiating the work of grace in your life. So what do you need to do? Quite frankly, nothing. He gives the gift of salvation. I would invite you to repent and believe that the kingdom of God is at hand, and in hearing the message of the gospel, receive grace. Receive it. Hear it, receive it, believe it. Christ is Lord. Believe it or not, the hard thing that Paul Apollos had to do then was to defend grace. Why? Well, it seems crazy to me through the scriptures how often grace has to be defended. Grace is awesome. It's free. We don't do anything. He just gives it to us. And from the beginning of the church, there's been those who've tried to seek to destroy the grace of God. Apollos helped the believers in Corinth by powerfully refuting the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was the Jesus. Was Jesus. He refuted the law, defending grace. Apollos came to Corinth with a newfound confidence because he had the whole counsel of God now explained to him from Priscilla and Aquila. And the Jews who rejected Paul were still there, now rejecting Apollos. What did Paul say? He's like, I've had enough. Your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. I'm out of here. I'm going to the Gentiles. Apollos, sharper mind perhaps, fervor in, fervent in spirit, he's ready, to, he's ready to, to, to debate with these guys, right? So he stands up in public. And it's one of those things with his enthusiasm, his joy, his competency in the scriptures. The crowds were just enamored and the saints were encouraged at how he refuted the law and defended grace so well and the coming of the Messiah. Apollos' goal, of course, was not just to best them, though. His goal was to, one, to defend the truth. He preached grace 
and uh, refuted works-based salvation till his death, so must we, amen, defend the truth. Second, he wanted to encourage the believers. They were all watching this take place. You know, having someone with great skill and competency fight for you and for the truth is a great encouragement. You know, in a sense, every time you come to church on Sundays and you hear a sermon, even if it's one of those kind where you get your toes stomped on, you should leave encouraged because somebody stood up here, opened the Bible to you, and proclaimed the truth of God and showed you the way of God more accurately and with boldness and with power. You should be encouraged every time you hear a sermon from the Bible. They lifted their spirits to see grace spoken of boldly, publicly, powerfully. And finally, he preached with the hope of conviction. His goal was not to win an argument. His goal was to win souls. He went to the scriptures, and then he made a beeline to Jesus. Isaiah 53, Genesis 3. Look, 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 at, the, look at the Savior who came, who died, who rose from the dead. This is the one we've been waiting for. Brothers, he was a Jew himself. Here, Christ has come. Wait no longer. This was not just about who is right and who is wrong. This was about a heaven to be gained and a hell to be spurned and only to be done and accomplished by the blood of Jesus. All the Jews who were there that day clinging to the law that they loved so much and were rejecting Jesus would die in their sins, perish forever under God's wrath unless they heard and believed in the grace of the cross. That's serious. And he preached with that kind of persuasion. So our hard task today is to continue refuting the law and preaching grace. When I see our church people canvassing our grounds with the idolatry of cars all around us and showing a greater God to be worshipped, my heart rejoices. You know, we've had a lot of car shows in the past, and we're fewer than num in number than any car show that I remember. I think we had more people trying to initiate spiritual conversations yesterday than any other car show ever. You know what that does? That builds me up. And it makes me th say, you know, these people must really believe in the gospel. These people must really believe in grace. Share the good news of Jesus. You are not Apollos, you are not Paul, but by the grace of God, you are what you are. Study apologetics. Learn how to defend your faith better in our culture. Be friends with unbelievers and speak when the opportunity presents itself. And remember that the same overcoming grace that caused you to believe is still captivating people of every tribe, tongue, and nation today. You are on the winning side, so don't be afraid to defend the winning side. And beloved, if any of this seems hard or intimidating to us this morning, let us remember that Jesus did the hardest thing. Right? Jesus did the hardest thing. He left heaven. He bore our sins in his body. He died the death that we deserved. And he did this hard thing to commemorate a meal in which we would remember the cross over and over and over and over and over again every time we take of it. We would proclaim his death until he comes. And we would be refreshed, encouraged, and emboldened do hard things for the church and for the kingdom of God. But we have a meal to celebrate.